and Project Timeline webinar. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Leslie Miska, and I joined the Office of Aging and Disability Services in February of 2016 um, as the Information Services Manager. My primary role within ODES is oversight and management of our electronic data systems, and that includes our existing system, EIS, and our future system, Evergreen. Joining me on the presentation today is Walter Goodlett. He is the Evergreen Project Organizational Change Management and Communications Subject Matter Expert. That's quite a mouthful. Um, but Walter is here to help us communicate about the system and the project. And um, you'll probably see him on future uh, meetings and webinars and interact with him if you um, submit feedback and things like that. Also on the call with me is Nancy Kitchen. Some of you may know her. She uh, works at the Office of Aging and Disability Services as a data and compliance specialist, but she's been involved in the Evergreen Project as a primary project participant since the beginning. She's been helping us out with requirements and testing, and she'll be involved in a lot of the training. So um, she'll also be participating in uh, communications and future meetings. Next slide, please, Miranda. Over the next hour, I'd like to uh, provide a little bit of project background for you, uh, share some new features and their benefits of the person, the Evergreen person record, um, give you a high level project roadmap, including our release three deploy date and the uh, training timeframes and dates, talk about some next steps and give you some details for how you can stay engaged and get support through this transition. And then uh, we'll wrap up with some questions and answers. We should have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. So um, to that end, you have been added to this webinar in listener mode. So you are muted. However, you can use the question and answer icon that's located at the bottom of your Zoom window. And you can submit questions at any time throughout the presentation. And then when we get to the end of the call, I will answer as many of those questions as I possibly can in the 15 minutes that we have remaining. And any that I don't get to, we certainly will provide answers for um, all of the questions and answers from all of the sessions in this series uh, are being collected, will be responded to, and will definitely be posted on our project website. So um, with that, we'll go on to the next slide, please, Miranda. So for those of you that don't already know, I'm sure most of you do because we have sent out several communications about this project over the past few years. But for those of you that don't know, the purpose of the Evergreen Data System Project is to implement a single electronic system to replace our office's three major legacy data systems, including EIS, MAPSIS, and MeCare. Um, the project is being completed in a phased approach, and this is the first phase or the first project, and that this project included three releases. The first release occurred in May of 2019. It was a very small pilot release, just a couple of internal users. And then we had our first major release in June of 2020, and that was for our Adult Protective Services and Public Guardianship Conservatorship programs. And our third release, which is upcoming, is the release that will be for our developmental disabilities and neurobehavioral programs. And that is planned for January of 2023. And the primary goal of all of this is to enhance the quality of services for our constituents. And through that, we also hope to uh, see the following benefits. Automation of some of our currently paper and manual processes, um, reduction of redundant data entry and capture, uh, streamlining some of the current workflows and processes, and improving our data and reporting. Next slide, please, Miranda. Over the course of the next six slides in this presentation, I'm going to share some new features and their benefits, and they're all going to be related to the Evergreen person record. I do want to point out that I will be providing high-level overview, so you, I might not point out every single feature on these slides on these uh, that you're seeing on the screen here. Um, however, there will be plenty of time for you to explore the system between now and January when we uh, deploy into the new system. The first feature I'd like to highlight is the robust centralized and shared person record, which means less redundant data capture for you. 
Evergreen uses role-based access. Um, this determines which person records, functional modules and forms, and data that you'll have access to view, add and or edit, or remove if your access role allows that. The white bar that's at the top of this screenshot is called the top level persistent navigation. This is available to you throughout the system. Once you've logged in, that bar will always be present and whatever icons and features your role has access to, they will always be there and you'll be able to access them no matter where you are in the system. Similar to EIS, most evergreen activity is completed within the context of a person record. So most users will start with a person search. And then once the search has been completed, it will navigate you into the person record, which is where this screenshot was taken from, from within the person record. So right below that white persistent navigation bar is a green bar. It's a little bit thicker. And that is called the person record banner. This banner will be persistent anytime you're within the context of a particular person record, and it will be specific to that person record. It's similar to um, EIS when you anchor on a person, you would get the, the information up at the top of the screen in EIS. This, this is a, sort of a replacement for that. It has a few additional pieces of information and some additional icons that are not present in EIS. The primary navigation appears down the left side of the screen, also similar to EIS. Each icon on that left menu, that primary navigation on the left, on the green bar, um, represents a different page within the person's record or different section or area or module, um, lots of different names. The very first icon is the dashboard. This is the person dashboard and it's the landing page when you navigate to the record. I, I did not take a screenshot of that. Um, but that's where you would be navigated into and it has some um, tiles in there with some specific information. The next icon down is the person summary. This is the equivalent of the EIS critical information. So this is where you're going to find things like um, crisis level uh, one, two, and three, uh, which we call living arrangement in um, Evergreen. You're going to find things like their assigned case manager, assigned guardian rep. You're gonna find um, you know, critical alerts, like anything that they're allergic to. Um, you know, uh, If they're a missing person, it will show up there. So there's lots of different critical information that's been captured in one screen for you there. So that's where you can find that kind of stuff. The bulk of the data in the person record is under the record icon. This icon is what this screenshot was taken from. That's why it's circled here in red and you can see that it's white. That's because I clicked into it when I took this screenshot. And so that's what this, the content in the center of the screen is displaying is the person record. The record contains lots of data, lots of demographic data, such as the person's names, date of birth, addresses, phone numbers, contacts, um, all their identifiers, the list goes on and on. There's, there's tons of uh, data in here. The record is a single page, so you can scroll to see every section or card as they're referred to of the record. Or you can um, click on the little toggle icon that I've circled in the upper right hand corner that Miranda's showing you right here. Um, and that will open up this additional right hand menu that's showing up below it, also circled. And this menu is referred to as the quick scroll menu. What this does is it shows you all the different sections of the person record. You can click on any one of them and the system will automatically navigate you directly to that section rather than you having to scroll all the way down to find that. So it's just a faster way, a more efficient way for you to navigate down to a different section or card. Sections or cards are delineated by a border um, with rounded corners. And I've put a red highlight around the first section, which is referred to as the personal information. That's what Miranda is showing you right now. 
Each section can also be manually collapsed and expanded with the little carrot icon to the left of the section header. Miranda's showing you that right now. Um, this just allows you to be able to see more stuff on the screen and collapse things that you're not interested in at that moment. If your role includes the ability to create new records or data points, then you would also have a plus add item button. Um, it's green, they're green in the person record and they're at the bottom of each section. And so you would simply click on that, it would pop over to modal and you'd be able to add additional details. And then when you hit save, it would store it in that section. If your role includes the ability to edit or remove items from a section or a form, you will see um, icons when you hover over that section. So if you have edit access, you would see a little pencil icon and you can click anywhere within that section and it will pop up the modal for you to edit it. Or if you have the ability to remove something, delete something, you would see a little trash can icon and you would click on that and it would ask you if you're sure you want to delete the record before it removes it. Next slide, please. Some data that's captured and maintained in the person record is also going to be automatically displayed on other forms within the system so that you don't have to recapture common data points. This is, again, another way that we're trying to reduce that redundant data capture for you, um, streamline your process a little bit, but also avoid conflicting data. Because if you, as you can imagine, if lots of different people are capturing the same information on a variety of different forms, then our data sometimes has contradictory information. So um, a lot of that information is captured here in the person record in Evergreen, and then it's just automatically displayed on the forms that you populate. Some examples of data like that are the health information and the history data. So this screenshot was taken of the health information and that data can be found um, right under the record icon. And this um, particular data also has a sub navigation menu. And that's why I took this screenshot for you. So you can see that this sub navigation flies out just to the right of that. And so health information has sections for allergy, devices and modifications, treatments, end of life orders, diagnoses, medications, and health insurance. This screenshot was taken when I was navigated to the allergies sub menu item. So the central content here shows you the allergy records for this Leslie test person. And all of these sub navigation sections are gonna look this, they're going to have the same layout as this allergies um, page does. And this is what's referred to as a list page, which is like a table or an Excel spreadsheet. So each record has its own row in it. And um, if you have the ability to add new items to a list page, then you would have that plus new button, white button in the left that Miranda's circling for you right now. And you'd click that, it would pop up a modal, you'd be able to enter the um, data, hit save, and it would then store that new data point, that new record, and it would appear in your table in the central content. The list pages are typically sorted with the newest data, either new entries or most recently modified entries at the top of the table. However, they can be sorted by any of the columns of data. So you can click on any one of the headers and it will sort it in an ascending order. And then if you click it again, it will sort it in a descending order. Um, some of the health information data is going to auto populate in the person record in Evergreen from the linked MIMS member record. This includes A number, social security number, date of birth when the record is created those items will populate from MIMS. In an ongoing daily um, state, the items like diagnoses, medications, and some medical professional contacts that are um, coming into MIMS on claims will also auto create evergreen records for you. So you'll start to see what are some of the diagnoses, what are some of the medications, and who are the doctors that are prescribing these or, or seeing these um, 
members, clients that we're um, serving. These, um, this health information, uh, sorry, aside from health information, also history. History is right below health information. This is a new section within Evergreen. Um, it's available from he here at the person record and it's structured to allow you to capture um, information, history items that you learn about this person over the time that we serve them. And you can store this detail, this history, using the uh, categories that align with the eight charting the life course domains. So that matches our current person-centered plan structure with the eight charting the life um, life course domains. And it also aligns with the new developmental disabilities comprehensive assessment that will be deployed when we go live in Evergreen. This comprehensive assessment um, will take the place of a few existing forms in EIS. So it will replace the BMS 99, the psychosocial and the V7. They're all um, combined into a single form called the comprehensive assessment. And all three, history, CompassS, and PCP, all use that same structure of that eight top level domains so that as history items get captured here, then they can be displayed for you in your comprehensive assessment. So under each dom top level domain, so that as you're populating the assessment, you don't have to keep navigating back to the person record to see what information we already know about that person in this area. So a, a great way to streamline your workflow as well. Other examples of data that might automatically display on a form for you are things like the person's date of birth, um, their assigned case manager, their assigned guardian representative, public guardian representative, or if they have a private uh, guardian conservatorship representative, that might show up on a form for you. Um, natural supporters, if those exist in their person record. And there are tons of other examples of data that will pre-fill and display for you in Evergreen. Next slide, please, Miranda. Data capture has also been standardized as much as possible in Evergreen, and this is in an effort to help us improve our data and reporting. So fields that are required to create or save a record or a form into an in-progress status so that you can populate them will be marked with a red asterisk to the right of the field name. So in this screenshot, I've uh, circled the field called type, and to the right of that, I know it's very small, but it, there's a little red asterisk. That would mean that this field needs to be populated in order to click save on this modal that you're seeing here. Um, if a field also has a yellow vertical bar to the left of the field, like type does here, that means that that field is also required to submit or complete the form. Um, some fields will just have a red asterisk, some fields might just have the yellow bar, and some fields will have both. Um, but that's the distinction between those two. Um, many fields also contain uh, predefined pick lists or drop down lists. We also refer to, we also refer to them as vocab lists. You'll know if a field is that type because it will have this little caret symbol or V um, looking symbol to the right of that field. You will you can click on that and it will drop down the list of values for you to select from, or you can simply start keying a value that you want to put in that field. And these fields use a predictive search. And so they would narrow the results that it's showing you based on the value that you're entering into that. Um, field for quicker, faster selection if it's a, a long drop down list. Most drop downs will have um, an other option. So if the value that you're looking for doesn't exist, you can select other. And if you do that, it will provide you an additional text field so that you can enter what the value is for the other type that wasn't there for you. Um, some fields will not have other. And if it does not have other, that is because we truly do want you to select one of the values that's being offered to you. Um, we also have date pickers in Evergreen. This is a new field type that doesn't exist in EIS. Um, and I have that circled under the effective date range here. It's a little calendar icon in the field. 
you can click that and it will pop up a bigger calendar and you can select the date, click on the date that you want, or you can um, simply type the date into the date field. And as long as you type it in the appropriate format, you can just save without having to go through the date picker. All fields will include some level of field validation to ensure that you know, dates only have numeric values, um, text fields will allow alpha, numeric, and, and likely special characters. All text fields have a character limit and that will be displayed to you what the character limit is. It will also show you the format for certain fields underneath, uh, that's what Miranda's showing you right now. And those um, text field limits will count down as you're typing into those fields. So you'll have an idea of how many characters you have left and if you exceed that, it will give you a little warning message that says, hey, you've exceeded this and you need to reduce the number of characters in this, this text box or else you won't be able to save. Um, and like description fields, note fields, comment fields, they're all, uh, most all of those are 10,000 characters in this system. So you'll have plenty of space to document your narrative, which is also very exciting. Next slide, please, Miranda. Evergreen also supports the upload of attachments. Yay, I know we're all excited about that. <laughs> so you can upload um, scanned images or documents and they will be stored within the person record. That's what the screenshot is showing you is attaching at the person record. In addition to being able to attack, attach here at the person record from this primary navigation, some specific forms that you'll create will also allow you to attach documents right to that form. A good example of that is our developmental disabilities intake and, uh, and eligibility assessment. That, that has some specific documents that need to be collected during that process. And so those can be attached directly to that form. And they don't have to be attached at the person record, but some more general records uh, may wanna be saved up here at the person level. Anything that is saved at the person record level is viewable by any person that has access to that person's record. They will have the ability to view that um, attachment within Evergreen in their browser, and they'll also have the ability to download that attachment. They will not, however, have the ability to edit the attachment's existence in the system or any of the data points that you um, put in that attachment. That's that um, is only editable by you or someone on my team. It's very easy to upload an attachment. You simply, um, if your role allows, you'll simply click the plus new attachment button. It will pop up a modal that looks just like this. You will click into the file field of this modal and it will then navigate you into your device's file system. And then you'll just select, search for and select the file, choose the file that you want assign it to a category. There's a number of categories that are available at the person level. Uh, it will default to today's date with no end date, but you can modify that if you need to. Um, and then you just need to provide a short description and click save and it will upload and save that document right into the system and it will appear as a new row in your list page, your tabs, attachments list page. Some attachments may already exist on your person records when we go live. We are migrating some of the EIS forms as attachments. Um, some forms that we are not um, replicating exactly as they exist in EIS, like the BMS 99, Psychosocial V7, because we've revamped those and made them into a single form, the data points weren't migrating as neatly and nicely as we wanted them to. So we're actually migrating those as uploaded PDF attachments for you so that you can see those in the format that they existed in EIS. Um, you may also, if the person, some one or more of the persons that you are um, assigned to or you provide services to um, is under public guardianship or conservatorship, then their guardianship representative may have also already uploaded some attachments to their record. So you might see some of those as well. Next slide, please, Miranda. 
This feature is called the Evergreen View Summary Shade. It's a really cool feature, and so I wanted to point it out for you. It's located in the Person Banner, which is that green banner that will be available to you when you're inside of a person record. And what, all you do is simply click on it, and it drops this shade that's shown in the screenshot right over whatever page of the person record or form that you're working on. So if you can imagine that you're like working on the conference of assessment or the person centered plan, and you're like, gee, I really wish I knew uh, if this person had any emergency contacts on their record, you can click the view summary, the shade will come down over the form that you're working on, and you can see that information. And then you simply just click the view summary again, and it will roll that shade right back up and you're right in the form that you were working on. So this is a piece of core functionality for our vendor's product. So we weren't able to customize it. So we are we are stuck with the fields of data that um, they offer in here, which are diagnoses, medications, allergies, warnings, which are like alerts or critical alerts, um, language needs, which comes from the communication section of the person record, eligibilities, which will include financial and program eligibility, um, active eligibilities, assigned care team. So anybody that's like an assigned case manager, care coordinator, guardianship, conservatorship representative, and um, any emergency contacts that are on their person record. But that is the reason why we also, in addition to this view summary, have that person summary that I pointed out in, in the person record on the primary navigation. Because we weren't able to customize this, we wanted to ensure that you had all of the critical data points that we feel in one easy to find location. So that's where you'll find all of the existing kind of EIS critical information is in that um, person summary, which is on your primary navigation. Um, next slide, please, Miranda. So the final feature that I want to highlight in today's webinar is called Notepad. Notepad is similar to like sticky notes if you've ever used that or another uh, similar um, app, app on like a smartphone or a tablet. Um, and it is available from the top level persistent navigation. So no matter where you are in the site, if you're just on your own staff dashboard, if you're in the person record, if you're in your notifications, um, wherever you might be, um, you can click this little icon that Miranda's circling for you here. It looks like a little notepad and it will pop up the modal that you see in the center of the screen that I've also highlighted here in red. And this will allow you to capture a title and uh, like the content, a description for this note. And then you can save this and it will save the note to your staff profile, my notes section. If your role is something like community case manager, state case manager, BI care coordinator, public guardianship conservatorship representative, there's probably others. Um, but if you have the ability to create progress notes, then you can navigate to your staff profile and you can promote this note up to a progress note under the context of the appropriate person record. So it's a really efficient way, a way to streamline your process is if you're working in the system and you get a call from somebody that you're serving or their uh, family member or guardian or something like that, and you don't want to navigate away from the form that you're working on, but you want to be able to capture the data, you can quickly capture it this way and then promote that up to a progress note and finish the progress note later. Um, so it's very handy. Next slide, please, Miranda. So we recognize uh, that one of the keys to a successful transition in a new system is to provide lots of training and very thorough training. So to this end, we are gonna be offering several types of training. And this training will start approximately two months ahead of the deploy. So um, around November 20th, we'll be sending out an email and it will contain, um, and we'll post to our website as well, our project website as well, but it will contain a series of um, several two to three minute micro learning videos. These little short video clips will, uh, you can watch them at your leisure at a time that's good for you. 
um, and they will teach you how to do the most basic things in the system, like how to log in, how to do a search, how to upload an attachment, how to um, create a progress note, et cetera. Um, and so you can review those in advance of your other training sessions. And then as many times as you need to after that. And again, they'll be posted on our website and they'll be available from within the Evergreen system itself, even after we go live so they can be watched over and over and over again. Then the week after Thanksgiving, um, some of Ode's staff, including my team, the information services unit, as well as Angela Faulkner's team, the community case management liaisons, and a couple of other key individuals, um, will receive some super user training. This is uh, an intensive, immersive training that's intended to allow us to learn as much as we can about the system to be able to support all of you once you're in the system and using it. After that, during the first week of December, ODES will offer um, some webinar style format, business process specific training sessions. So these will be focus areas like the person-centered planning and service implementation planning process. And, the, and it's intended to show you a process that you already do and you know, but how you'll do that in the system. So it will give you a little um, advantage and heads up before you go into your technical training. So technical training is offered by the vendor, FEI. They, are, they do not know our business process the way that we know it. Um, but they know the system. So they're going to teach you how to navigate the system, how to create forms, edit forms, remove things if you have that ability, how to run reports, use notifications, things like that. They're going to teach you how to do the basics of the system. Um, so pr business process combined with technical should give you everything that you need there. Also, after your technical training sessions have been offered, um, we will uh, provide you with uh, credentials to be able to log into our sandbox training environment. So you'll be able to navigate around in there and get familiar with the system yourself. Um, and you'll have approximately three weeks prior to the deploy to do that, two to three weeks to do that. Um, and so role-based technical training is gonna be offered uh, by topic, by your role. Um, some roles like community case managers, BI care coordinators, you uh, use the most features of the system, the most forms and modules. So you'll have several topics that you'll be trained on. Um, other roles like uh, crisis caseworker or resource coordinator, they may only have a single topic that they get trained on um, because their role is more focused in the system. All topic areas will be offered um, in more on more than one day, so that you can, you know, we're trying to offer them as much as we can, so that you can hopefully attend one. They will all be virtual, um, all webinar style, and all recorded. So if you're not able to make one of them, that's okay. You'll be able to play the recording back. The recordings will be posted to our project website as well, and available for playback as many times and as often as you need to, and use in the future for um, new staff that might come in after deploy. You'll be able to train them by having them watch the series, appropriate series of videos. And they'll also be available from within our Evergreen um, site itself. So you can uh, access them in the help center and review them from in there. So training is optional. Um, we're not going to require it, but we do strongly encourage it. Um, after all of that training, and after you've had a chance to play around in there and familiarize with your system, self with the system, uh, FEI, our vendor, will be offering some Q&A sessions. Those will occur the week before we go live from January 9th to the 12th. And they're truly intended for you to come. They will be virtual like this Zoom meeting, webinar style, but you can collect your questions along the way um, while you're um, navigating around in the system and bring those to those meetings, put them into the Q&A chat. And that's the whole format is just responding to questions and helping you find the answers to those before the deploy. 
all questions and answers from all of the trainings, from those sessions, from these demos are always being collected. And we're gonna continue to update a frequently asked questions page on our project website. So you will be able to go to that and find all of the questions and answers at any time. And then once we've gotten through the Q&A sessions, um, we'll go live on January 16th, 2024. But the support doesn't end there. We, um, with any large electronic data system replacement project, there's gonna be lots of obvious benefits, but we also know that it's not gonna be perfect. There are gonna be some issues and we're gonna to have to work around those and we're gonna to have to work together to you know, find workarounds for some of those things until we're able to fix them. And, or um, we already know that there are some future enhancements that we're gonna to wanna to make to the system. So um, we want to be able to provide you with some post-deploy troubleshooting support. And also we recognize that that will just help make the transition a little bit easier as well. We don't know exactly um, what the format of that looks like yet. We're still figuring all that out, but um, we certainly will provide some more details about how you can access that um, post-deploy troubleshooting support, um, when it will be available, how long it will be available to you, um, and we'll provide that information as we get closer to training in um, probably in later November, we'll provide you some of the details for that or during your training. Uh, next slide, please, Miranda. This slide, uh, gives you some information, some high level project, remaining project activities. So the project team, uh, along with um, some of our internal business system users are already uh, underway with the first three items. So these are um, activities of various testing and data validation. And um, along with that testing and validation comes uh, issue recovery. So we're over here doing the testing and validation and our vendor is remediating the issues that we're finding. Excuse me, the first two items are related to testing the functionality and role-based access of the system. And the third item that's listed there is specific to validating the migrated data. Once the functional testing has wrapped up, the test team will begin, uh, or the project team will begin activities for certifying the system's security with the state of Maine and ensuring that it has achieved its intended outcomes with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So that's the uh, row that you see in the middle there that's labeled system certification. That's what's happening under those under that row. Um, at the same time or overlapping there uh, is when training begins. So at the same time, we'll also be holding all of those various training sessions and the, and the um, project team will be doing a test deploy. Um, which is referred to as a dry run, which is what you see down there um, in early January. And then the deployment itself uh, is expected to take a minimum of three days. So we're currently planning to begin at 5 p.m. on Friday, um, January 12th, 2024. And the deploy itself will be completed sometime before 8 a.m. on Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. During that period, both EIS and the Evergreen system will be set to read-only mode. Um, this is so that users cannot modify data in either of those systems while we are trying to migrate the data from EIS into Evergreen. We don't want anything to get messed up with that process. At 8 a.m. on Tuesday, January 16th, 2024, Evergreen will be turned on for user access. It will be returned on for those that are currently using it and turned on new for those that are coming from EIS. EIS will still remain available in its read-only mode. So you'll still be able to use your existing credentials and you'll be able to log in there and you'll be able to find data in there. You just won't be able to add new data to EIS or modify any data in EIS. This is just another way that we're trying to make sure that you have all the tools that you need to be successful in the new system. We know that you know where to find things in EIS, so we want you to be able to, if you're struggling to find it in Evergreen, to be able to quickly find it in EIS and, and move on until you can uh, learn where it's found in Evergreen. 
this EIS will stay in that read-only state for at least six months and likely all the way through the calendar year of 2024. We're still trying to figure out exactly what the, the final date of EIS read-only mode will be, um, but we'll certainly share that information out with you in advance of that and uh, so that you're aware. Uh, next slide, please, Miranda. So you might be wondering, okay, what comes next? Um, for starters, if you haven't already registered for the upcoming informa other informational webinar series, we strongly encourage you to do that. Um, in our November 1st through 3rd series, we'll be um, going over some of the cool new features of the reportable events form and the progress note form. And then in uh, the series that's planned for November 13th to the 15th, we'll be giving you a sneak peek at the streamlined person-centered planning and prior authorization process. You can find uh, links to register for those series in the email communication that went out on September 25th, or you can go to our project website. They're all posted up on our project website now and you can uh, register there. We also encourage you to continue to read our email communications. We will be sending out a couple more communications um, one likely after each of these series, just directing people back to the project website. Um, and then um, one, a couple probably in the December and um, January timeframe, reminding you of training and uh, the upcoming deploy. And um, another thing that you can be doing between now and then is working to clean up your EIS data. This will ensure the most successful migration possible for your data. You can find details on the steps for how to do that also in that September 25th email that was sent out. The subject of that email is update on Evergreen Release 3 rollout. That's also posted to our project website. Um, and if you didn't receive that email, that's definitely an indicator that your email address is not accurate in EIS. So if you're not receiving our email communications, we do encourage you to um, get those updated with our team. The last thing uh, that you can do as a next step is register for training when those training registration links are posted. We expect to post those on our project website and communicate to you about them in early November or sometime in November, probably early to mid-November. Next slide, please, Miranda. So how you can stay engaged and find other support resources is um, the first bit that we're very excited about is the creation of a network of volunteers that are called Change Champions. These are individuals who are your peers. They work with you or they work uh, with the office in a capacity um, that supports you. And um, these individuals will help with the transition to Evergreen and they'll answer questions that you might have. And you can find out more about them at our project website, who they are, um, the list of who they are at our project website. Um, all of our project communications, as I mentioned previously, are sent by email. So uh, again, make sure that your email address is accurate in EIS. If it's not, please send an email to our um, team at eissupport.dhhs.main.gov and get that updated. Also, uh, at any time, you can email questions, feedback, comments, whatever you have to our project email address at evergreen.dhhs.main.gov. And you can always go to our project website, all of the communications, all of the recorded webinars, all of the recorded trainings, everything is getting posted up there. So that is main.gov slash DHHS slash EIS slash Evergreen. Next slide, please, Miranda. So there we are. We've made it to the Q&A portion. And I do have some questions already queued up here. So I'll uh, start answering these. And if you have other questions, please use that Q&A icon that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your question. And I will respond to as many as we can in this last 15 minutes. So um, Ian asks, could we be provided with a test account um, in time? It would be a very useful training tool as we learn and train other staff. Um, so Ian, you'll definitely be uh, provided with a test account um, as part of your training, um, that will expire um, at some point after we go live. Um, so we can't keep our training test environment up in perpetuity, um, but it will be available for a period of time after we go live. I believe it will be uh, supported through February. Don't quote me on that. 
um, I'll definitely get the appropriate length of time and we'll get that added to the Q&A. Um, but all, again, all of the training itself is uh, definitely going to be recorded. And so for new staff that are coming in, they'll be able to re review all these training recordings and they should get uh, ample information before they uh, log into the system. Carol asks, I missed the very beginning, so I apologize if it was stated, but uh, will these slides be available to have? Ah, thank you, Carol. Actually, I did not say that. All of the recorded uh, webinars and the slides themselves will be posted to our project website. So yes, you can go out there and get the slide deck and review those, uh, but you can also play back the uh, recording or just the beginning of one of the recordings if you'd like as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Amy asks, um, I'm not familiar with the other with other domains that will be merged with EIS. Does this mean progress notes will also be the notes from other services such as home supports and community supports, et cetera? Uh, good question, Amy. So yes, um, Evergreen, uh, so right now Evergreen has our adult protective services and public guardianship conservatorship programs in there. And then after deploy, it will have developmental disabilities and uh, traumatic brain injury and other related conditions, home support um, providers. So uh, those programs are currently in EIS and yes, those will be in um, Evergreen. APS and guardianship though are sort of segregated off. So there is some access control between those. So you won't see as a developmental disabilities or traumatic brain injury, you won't see any APS reports or notes or anything like that. Um, and uh, as a APS person, they will have access to the person record, but they won't necessarily have access to view um, progress notes and things like that. And uh, similarly, uh, access is controlled based on your role. So like home supports providers will not be able to see general progress notes that are created by community case managers and vice versa. So although all of those types of progress notes are going to be captured in there in the person record, depending on your role, you'll only be able to see certain progress notes, ones that you are able to create or view. Ian asks, what is the rollout date for developmental uh, services? January 16th, 2024. So all of our um, current Office of Aging and Disability Services um, EIS programs and EIS functionality will all go live together on January 16th, 2024 in Evergreen. Naomi asks, will we be able to print plans when EIS is in read-only? Uh, great question, Naomi. I do not believe that you will have the ability to print anything from EIS. That being said, um, you will have the ability to print from Evergreen, and several of those forms will have been migrated as attachments to the person record, um, including some of the primary ones like BMS 99, psychosocial, PCP, if it's a historic one, um, things like that. Um, and you'll also be able to print uh, other non-historic data will be what's called source target migrated. So um, current PCPs will be migrated right into the Evergreen PCP form itself. And so you'll be able to access that and you'll have a print option for that PCP. So you should not need to print the forms from EIS. However, um, if there is some unique situation where you aren't finding what you need to be able to print from within Evergreen, you can always contact my team, the Information Services Unit team, and we can help you um, gain access to whatever you might have needed for, for data. Laura asks, what are the assessments that will be under one assessment? I believe you called it comprehensive assessment. Can you elaborate a little? Yes, Laura, I will elaborate a little bit. We also, you'll also want to um, join the November 13th to 15th um, session, we might talk a little bit more about comprehensive assessment there. But yes, this is a developmental disabilities form, and it combines the current EIS BMS 99, um, 
psychosocial and parts of the V7. And then other parts of the V7, I think are in the PCP as well in um, Evergreen. So it's uh, those three forms that are combined together there. Krista asks, what kind of reports will be available for supervisors to monitor notes, plans, or other items? This is a fantastic question, Krista. So um, we do have a reports module in Evergreen and supervisor roles will have access to a few different reports. There is one report in particular that I think is gonna be the most useful report to all of our users, whether you're a supervisor or not. It's called the to-do report. It's kind of a, a funny name, but um, it's basically a report that allows you to run, you can filter it in any way, but you can run it on a date range and it will produce for you all, if, if you don't filter it down, all of the reports, uh, sorry, all of the forms that exist for the persons, like if, if it's a case manager that runs it, it would be all of the forms that exist for the persons that you're assigned to. Um, and you can filter it to say, I only want ones that are not in a complete stat status, or I only want PCPs, or, or however you want to slice and dice it, you can run that report and it will give you a list of results. Um, as a manager, as a supervisor, it will allow you to run that and you can get all of that information for all of your subordinates. So anybody that reports up to you, you'd be able to get a list of all of their forms notes, things like that, that are um, in progress. If you wanted completed ones, you can get completed ones and it will give you like dates and things like that. So it's a very robust report. And I think that's going to be the one that you guys are going to be the most interested in. Will each staff login uh, have, this comes from Carrie, will each staff login have a list of their clients similar to EIS or will they have to search by typing a client name each time? Uh, great question, Carrie. So if you are uh, explicitly assigned somebody, so if you're a community case manager, a BI care monitor, a public guardianship conservatorship representative, and you have an explicit relationship to a list of clients, a caseload, um, then when you log into the system, ev when everybody logs into the system, you go to your user dashboard. That's where you come into the system right after login. And on that user dashboard for those roles that I just named and possibly a couple of others, um, you will have what's called a caseload tile. And this will give you a list of your actively assigned persons. And so you can simply click on a person record and navigate in from your caseload list. Um, you can also do a person search if um, you're looking for somebody that you're not assigned to. Um, uh, but if you are uh, one of those roles, you uh, likely will only be seeing person records that you have explicit relationships to anyhow. Um, for other users that don't have explicit relationships and won't have a caseload, they will need to do a search. However, um, the search does retain your last 20 search um, queries. So uh, if you're searching for the same person a lot, you can just keep clicking on that search history so that you don't have to type it in every single time. Ian asks, will the depart will the Division of Licensing have access to Evergreen and reportable events? Currently reporting incidents, um, which qualify for um, licensing must be done separately outside of the EIS. That's also a great question, Ian. Um, this, is, this is actually on our roadmap for future enhancements. Um, We've been in talks with uh, Division of Licensing regarding reportable events for quite some time now. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, this project was very large. And so we had to, you know, keep determine what was the most critical um, scope. So unfortunately, this is not going to be one of the features that's uh, part of the deploy. However, our reportable events form has been enhanced. Um, to allow us to identify some of these um, data points a little bit better. So I would strongly encourage you to come to the uh, November 1st to 3rd series because we'll be doing a deeper dive on the reportable events form itself. So I think there, if a memory serves me correctly, I think there is a way to identify um, a data point that might be related to um, a licensing report. 
Um, and that looks like it was the last question that was in the Q&A. We do have five minutes left. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to um, drop them into the, the Q&A using the Q&A icon, and I'd be happy to answer those. Lucinda asks, um, maybe to help on Ian's question, if you call the APS intake line. Okay, uh, great. So um, it, if you call the APS intake line to report events, is there a licensing issue concern? If there is a licensing issue concern, APS intake will also send the report to licensing. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, yeah, so um, definitely uh, if there's any um, suspected abuse, neglect, or exploitation, then you uh, should certainly be calling the Adult Protective Services line. Um, but also, again, uh, strongly encourage you guys to come to that reportable events um, series at the first of November because um, the reportable event form does have some a few new features, and um, one of those is to indicate if you believe uh, if there's any suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And because we'll be a shared system with APS, they will get a notification for critical incidents that have that that selection made. So they'll be alerted to um, reportable events that get entered that there is uh, suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Um, any other questions at this time? I do have a couple minutes left. Would be happy to answer them. Again, if you think of questions afterwards as well, please feel free to email those to us at evergreen.dhhs at maine.gov. Uh, Miranda's awesome and she has put into the meeting chat our um, link to our project webpage. Um, that's where all the FAQs will be um, posted probably early next week from this webinar series. Um, and then that's where you can find the registration links for the um, other November webinars. And then she's also put the email addresses for our EIS um, account team for getting your email addresses updated and our evergreen email address for other questions. Um, Ian, uh, asking, uh, clarification, is there a change in the process? No, Ian, the process is not changing for reporting to APS. You should still call APS. Um, anytime that there's a suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation as mandated reporters, you should be, uh, calling the APS intake to report those. However, as a fail safe, um, we are adding this checkbox here so that we can capture that data point um, for critical incidents that are being entered. And if you are, if, um, if there is suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation, we're capturing that additional data point on the reportable event form. Any final questions in our last couple of minutes? You guys have been a great group, lots of awesome questions. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate the questions. And as I mentioned, um, all Q&A will be posted to the project website. Please feel free to continue to send questions to evergreen.dhhs at maine.gov. And also please join us at our November webinars. We'd be uh, thrilled to share more um, cool features with you and in advance of your training so that you can have as much information as possible before we before we migrate in. Thanks everybody, have a fabulous Friday. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend.